powerful storms that are really more reminiscent of something we're used to seeing in the springtime. They slam the south now with tornadoes, damaging winds and flooding. Power has been knocked out to thousands of people and at least 12 people have been killed. Our Kaylee Hartung is in Louisiana for us where there was an EF2 tornado that cut a 40 mile path of destruction. Hello, Kaylee. And that's right. Good morning, TJ. This is what it looks like when an EF2 tornado rips through your home. Jerry and Mary Sue Franks were killed when their home was torn from its foundation about 200 feet from where I'm standing. Take a look at this wide angle. 135 mile per hour winds shredding this home to the pieces you see around me. A lifetime of memories scattered across this vast area. This morning, residents waking up to more destruction after two tornadoes touched down in the middle of the night. Residents reeling from the devastating tornadoes across the U.S. At least 12 people were killed during the severe weekend storms spanning from Texas to Ohio. This is a fence on top of a home. In Ohio, two tornadoes, forceful winds uprooting this tree and ripping out the sidewalk underneath it. The strong wind sending this building's rooftop to the ground. The crushed debris blocking the entranceway as firefighters work to clear the streets below. And in Alabama, a tornado tormenting Pickens County, leaving three dead. In Louisiana, tornado damage toppling trees, uprooting hundreds, the destruction stretching for miles. The EF2 tornado eradicating homes, tossing this mobile home from its foundation, killing an elderly couple inside. To wake up and see the news this morning was, was really sad. In South Carolina, tornado damage ripping this school's roof right off. Brick and cement debris litter the lawn. The wind smashing these buses into each other. The top of these bleachers torn away. The Franks family spent the weekend digging through mud and debris to salvage what they could. A few precious family photos were found. As the sun comes up, this community continues to clean up the mess and heal. Robin of everybody impacted. All right, Kaylee, thank you. Quite a contrast here on the East Coast and Northeast experiencing record warm temperature. Ginger is here with the latest on that. Good morning, Ginger. Good morning to you. It felt like March and it looked like March with those severe storms. Record warmth, dozens of daily records that were broken and then all time January heat from Boston to Naples. We have never seen that type of heat in recorded history in a couple of these cities. So just noting that, you know this is more reminiscent of late February, early March. We have never had 400 and 66 severe storm reports in January on a day like we did yesterday, at least going back to 2000, but probably ever. We're going to verify that. But look at that. That was just over the weekend. More than 700 damaging wind, hail, and tornado reports. Guys. Oh, that is some map. Okay, Ginger, thanks very much. These rugged and barren mountains have become a hub for ISIL sleeper cells. About 250 fighters are estimated to be hiding here, including some foreign fighters who crossed back from Syria. They are strong, you know, after the, after what happened in the Syria, too many final fighters, they came back to the Iraqi side. That's a big problem now. We are on the mountains of Karachok, near the town of Mahmur, once under control of ISIL, a natural protective boundary that overlooks a vast territory claimed by both Iraq and the Kurds. This is the last position of the Kurdish Peshmerga. The defense line of the Iraqi army is about five kilometers away from here. And in between, you have ISIL fighters hiding in caves at the bottom of this mountain. The mountain range is ideal territory for sleeper cells to lay low. Kurdish officials say the fighters have dug a network of tunnels to connect some of them and are taking advantage of a security vacuum. ISIL, as a terrorist organization, is not finished, but it's changing its way of operating. It lost territory, and now it's organized in small cells on the move. In 2018, there were 456 attacks and 1,242 killed. In 2019, there were 238 attacks and 1,058 casualties. And it continues. They happen mainly in the so-called disputed territories, a vulnerable belt along the borders of the Kurdish region. The Kurds are against the withdrawal of foreign troops. They have boycotted the non-binding vote held by Iraq's parliament. We think this decision was one of emotion rather than logic. It was hastily taken. 
There are realities on the ground, there are financial and security issues that have to be taken into account. I don't think pressure from certain political parties in Iraq or the killing of Qasem Soleimani and Abu Mahdi al muhandis were a strong enough reason for the vote to take place. Joint operations are key to prevent ISIL from regrouping. Here, one carried out in the Hamreen Mountains near Kirkuk, days before the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. Forces under his command have also played a key role in the fight against ISIL. Since Soleimani's death, the fight against ISIL continues but at a slower pace. Kurds and those living in places like Karachok and Mahmur fear that ISIL could take advantage to strengthen its foothold on the area once again. Hod Abdel Hamid, Al Jazeera in northern Iraq. Midwinter in the furthest reaches of northeastern Greece, gale force winds and bitter cold. In this vast, barely inhabited wilderness, there are plenty of places to hide, but break cover and you risk everything. At the hospital mortuary is evidence of the risk. Sisters from Somalia who froze to death in each other's arms, two among dozens who recently perished. Many more, though, have been killed in car accidents as the police have tried to chase down the smugglers. In the last case, we have uh, we have uh, 70 people in one car. We have car accident. They died seven of them and 10 people who wounded. How do they hide 17 people in a car? I don't know. The more hostile Europe becomes, the better business gets for the smugglers. On the Evros River, the border between Turkey and Greece, they're using the same big rubber boats that take people over the sea. On land, fleets of vehicles seized by the police tell a story of the increasing industrialization of illegal migration into the European Union. They're training migrants to be guides. They leave cars on the hills for them and tell one of the migrants to be the driver. Some of them are children and don't even know how to drive properly. Refugees are guided to deserted buildings, sleeping in the rat droppings with the windows open to escape if the army arrives. Locals film them as they pass in small groups, but barely a word is spoken. Europe has become a hostile environment for asylum seekers, and these are the consequences. If they've made it this far and they're still alive, it means they've dodged the Greek police and military and followed the smugglers' instructions, stayed off the roads, stayed on the tracks, but it's at least another hundred kilometers from here to any form of civilization, several hundred more until they get to the border with North Macedonia. Nazir, who'd come all the way from Afghanistan, made it through the wilderness. Did anybody help you? No, nobody can help us. When we fall down, when we have injuries in our body, nobody can help us. We just help ourselves. That's it. Thousands are still coming across. The success of the smugglers and difficulty for the police in covering vast areas means far more people get through than die. They're out there, somewhere. Lawrence Lee, Al Jazeera, northeastern Greece. Federal authorities announced Monday that the Saudi military trainee who killed three U.S. military members in the Pensacola Naval Station shooting in December had been plotting the attack for months and intended to do much more damage. This was an act of terrorism. The evidence shows that the shooter was motivated by jihadist ideology. The killer, Saudi pilot Mohammed Saeed al-Shamrani, who was killed by law enforcement, had been reading and posting jihadi messages on social media just two hours before his deadly rampage. Investigators say the gunman intended to kill many more. He had more than 180 rounds of ammunition for his handgun. The investigation uncovered more concerns, leading to the deportation of 21 Saudi students. Officials discovered at least 17 of the trainees had jihadi literature in their possession. Others had child porn on their computers. I do think it's clear that we have to improve our vetting procedures. Barr is asking Apple for help getting into the shooter's iPhone to learn more. This comes as authorities reveal that a homegrown terror attack in December also could have been much worse. Two suspects opened fire on a Jewish grocery store, killing three. 
The U.S. attorney in New Jersey and head of the local FBI now says a powerful bomb found inside their van could have killed or injured people up to five football fields away. We know now that they planned greater acts um, of mayhem. This uh, was in fact a hate crime and an episode of domestic terrorism. Police say a detective killed by the suspects spotted them in a cemetery right before the attack and may have altered their plan. Officials say they had researched a Jewish community center in nearby Bayonne as a possible target. The attack came amidst a rash of anti-Semitic incidents in the New York area, including an assault on a Hanukkah gathering that left five people injured. According to a recent report, anti-Semitic hate crimes in major cities in the U.S. are expected to hit an 18-year high this year. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. We're going to begin with that turmoil in Iran. Violent protests erupting as people take to the streets there, protesting the regime after Iran admitted it accidentally shot down a passenger plane. Chief Global Affairs Correspondent Martha Raditz is back from Iran tracking the very latest. Good morning, Martha. Good morning, Robin. A week ago, this was a country with masses of people shouting down the United States. But this morning in Iran, the anger is aimed at their own leaders. Protests in the streets of Iran over the shootdown of that passenger jet. Overnight, thousands of Iranians flooding the streets for a second day. The Associated Press showing tear gas hurled at crowds with video and witness accounts of protesters beaten and live ammunition fired. Iran denying the use of live ammunition. The denial coming after the Iranian government finally admitted that its military forces accidentally shot down a Ukrainian commercial aircraft killing all 176 passengers on board. This after three days of claiming mechanical errors brought down the plane. The Iranian government now saying they mistook the passenger jet for an incoming missile just hours after Iran targeted American-backed bases in Iraq in retaliation for the U.S. killing Qasem Soleimani, a top Iranian general. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani tweeting, armed forces internal investigation has concluded that regrettably missiles fired due to human error caused the horrific crash of the Ukrainian plane. In a televised speech, even hardliners apologizing. The commander in charge saying he wished he'd been on that plane himself so he wouldn't feel so ashamed in front of his nation, adding, quote, we never thought we would harm our own people. In the aftermath of Soleimani's death, Iranians were united, angrily protesting against the United States drone strike on Soleimani. Now Iran's unity shattered. Iranian protesters ripping down posters of Soleimani, the slain military leader, and some protesters refusing to trample the image of an American flag. Overnight, President Donald Trump supporting the new protests tweeting a warning in English and Farsi to the leaders of Iran, do not kill your protesters. And this morning, hardliners have started threatening people from holding large-scale funerals where slogans against the Iranian regime might be shouted. George. Okay, Martha, welcome back from Iran. There is a lot of anger in Iran after authorities admit to mistakenly shooting down a passenger plane that killed all 176 people on board. Crowds in Tehran are calling on its leaders to step down, sparking renewed anti-government protests across their country. Meanwhile, over in Canada, many continue to mourn the tragic loss of those who died on board that passenger jet, while a team of Canadian investigators are starting to arrive in Tehran. RT's Alex Mihailovich is joining us live from Toronto with more on this. Uh, so, Alex, let's start with the Canadian investigators. What is the latest there? So Iran is issuing more visas for the Canadian investigation team. They've, uh, there have been three investigators on the ground since Saturday, uh, setting up a base of operations. In total, we're going to see 12 investigators in Tehran at that airport seeing exactly or trying to discover exactly what happened to that plane. Uh, Canada's foreign minister says that the standing rapid deployment team, that's this team of investigators, should be ready to roll uh, by the 14th, meaning that the full investigation will start at 
that point. As for the Prime Minister, he said that the Iranian president, Hassan Rouhani, has committed to working with the Canadian investigators. So as you can see, there has been communication between Canada and Iran as we move forward. Obviously, Canada has been deeply affected by this tragedy. What is the Prime Minister now saying? Well, as you can imagine, people from coast to coast are mourning what happened here. And uh, you can see this. Here's a vigil in Toronto. Uh, this happened uh, just on Sunday. Uh, people are coming out in droves just to show their respects to the, not only the victims, but to the family members of these people. Uh, you know, originally, there was believed to be 63 Canadians who were killed. Canada's government has changed that number to 57, along with many who were connected to Canada in one way or another. Uh, that doesn't change the fact that many people died in this tragedy and of course Canada as I mentioned is in mourning for everybody that was on that plane and in a, in a heartfelt speech Trudeau said that Canada stands with the victims and their families he then addressed the investigation itself take a listen to this we will continue to work with our partners to ensure that a full transparent investigation is conducted I want to assure all families and all Canadians we will not rest until there are answers. We will not rest until there is justice and accountability. Now Trudeau added that compensation must come from Iran and that must be added to the mix that we're talking about. This is not ending here. And Alex, it is not just Justin Trudeau voicing his opinion on this. A prominent Canadian CEO has had some harsh words for President Trump regarding this situation. What can you tell us about him? Michael McCain, he is the head of Maple Leaf Foods, and he came out with some uh, pretty harsh words towards the United States, basically saying that the country needs to take part of the blame for what happened to that plane. In a series of tweets uh, using the company's own Twitter account, uh, this is what he said. So a narcissist in Washington tears world accomplishments apart, destabilizes region. U.S. now unwelcome everywhere in the area, including Iraq. Tensions escalating to feverish pitch, taking out despicable military leader terrorist. There are a hundred like him standing next in line. The collateral damage of this irresponsible, dangerous, ill-conceived behavior. 63 Canadians needlessly lost their lives in the crossfire, including the family of one of my Maple Leaf Foods colleagues, his wife and 11-year-old son. We are mourning and I am livid. And that was Michael McCain. Now, talking to people in this country and, you know, frankly, I've heard from people abroad as well, many are in the same frame of thought. People are saying if the U.S. didn't take action against an Iranian general, and we're hearing more and more so that this action wasn't exactly for the reasons that we heard in the beginning, people are saying if that didn't happen, well, this plane would have never shot down and these people would not have been killed. Yeah, it's certainly a dangerous tit for tat. Alex Mihailovich, live for us in Toronto. Tonight, Thank you. The vaccination debate rages on in this country, even though we know vaccinations are safe and necessary. Lawmakers in New Jersey failed to pass a bill that would have eliminated religious exemptions for school-required vaccinations. And a new poll shows support for vaccinations has dropped 10 percent in the U.S. over the past two decades. Meg Oliver now on what's driving the decline. New Jersey is the latest state fighting over vaccination requirements for children to attend public school. On Monday, thousands protested a bill that would eliminate religious exemptions. Lisa DeRogotis has never vaccinated her three children. I feel like this is a fascist overreach of the government and taking away religious and medical freedoms. The new poll shows a 20-year drop in vaccine support among all age groups, the steepest, ages 30 to 49, at 12 percent. But 86 percent of Americans say vaccines are not more dangerous than the diseases they prevent. Dr. Peter Hotez is an infectious disease specialist. We're seeing a decline uh, because of a rise in anti-vaccine misinformation coupled with uh, political activities. Five states have banned non-medical exemptions, including New York, which eliminated its religious exemption last year after measles outbreaks that started in 2018. 
Public health officials say vaccine rates need to stay high above 90 percent to protect those who can't be vaccinated, babies and those who are immune compromised. Until we step up our level of advocacy and take down the fake information, the measles epidemics that we saw in 2019 are going to become a new normal in America. The World Health Organization called skepticism about vaccines one of the top 10 global health threats in 2019. At a summit last month, they said more doctor training is needed to address concerns from the public. Nora. An education campaign. Meg, thank you. Hardly any civilian is allowed to enter the town of Agoncillo now. And it is clear why. Did he say? There's just a massive earthquake. I know even police officers will have to leave from their station. We were just here a few moments ago hoping to embed with them, but now we really, we really have to leave this place. Officials are calling this area Ground Zero. Agoncillo is just around 10 kilometers away from the Taal volcano that erupted on Sunday, spewing ashes and lava. We've been told that water in this lake has gone up by a meter, raising fears that it might spill over its banks hampering efforts to help those in need. You saw how it's like. The situation is so volatile. It is hard for us even to secure our own men. This is why we don't allow most civilians to return. Violent explosions like these haven't been seen here in decades. And experts warn there could be more. More than 20,000 people have been displaced, moved to at least 100 evacuation sites. And it's not clear when they might return. But some have decided to stay, like the Mendoza clan. During the day, they look after their cattle and whatever is left of their homes. And at night, they go back to the evacuation site. Our human lives are important, of course. But we also look after our animals and do our best to save them. I never thought we would live to see this day. It is really scary. We are afraid. Just a few days ago, Agoncillo was a thriving agricultural town. Now people here say it's as if their lives have been put on hold and are full of agony and distress. Jamela Alindogan, Al Jazeera, Agoncillo, Batangas Province, Northern Philippines. Weekend. And for today, just as an FYI, there will not be a Good News Monday, but I would like to take you to this report from The Most Important News, written by Michael Schneider. And the headline reads, Why are volcanoes all over the world suddenly shooting giant clouds of ash miles into the air? The report goes on to read that there certainly hasn't been a lack of seismic activity so far in 2020. Just a few days ago, more than 1,000 earthquakes have rattled Puerto Rico so far. But right now, volcanoes eruptions have been taking center stage. In particular, a massive eruption in the Philippines is making headlines all over the world. But what most people don't realize is that several other volcanoes have also blown their tops in a spectacular fashion within just the past week. Suddenly, volcanoes all over the globe are shooting giant clouds of ash miles into the air. And this is greatly puzzling many of the experts. Let's take a look at what occurred over the past seven days. Last Tuesday, one of the most important volcanoes in Alaska shot hot ash 25,000 feet into the air. The initial ash cloud was 19,000 feet high. Clouds initially obscured the mountain, but satellite imagery confirmed the ash cloud. Seismic activity diminished for a few hours, but then it increased again. And during the increase, the volcano spewed an ash cloud to 25,000 feet, according to the observatory. There are 5,280 feet in a mile. And so we are talking about an ash cloud nearly five miles high. Then on Thursday, Mount Popotecapel, 
in Mexico shot hot ash nearly four miles into the sky or 20,000 feet into the sky. Michael goes on to state that those that follow my work on a regular basis already know that I am deeply concerned about this volcano. It has the potential to create the worst natural disaster in modern history of North America because it is quite close to Mexico City. Here is just a small summary of the potential threat that this volcano can pose. Approximately 26 million people live within 60 miles of the crater. And so we are talking about the potential for death and destruction on a scale that is difficult to imagine. In ancient times, this volcano buried an entire Aztec cities in superheated mud. But then it went to sleep for about a thousand years. Unfortunately for us, it started waking up again in the 1990s. And now this is the most active that we have seen it ever since the volcano originally reawakened. So let us hope that it settles down because the death and destruction that a catastrophic eruption would cause would be off the charts. Meanwhile, down in South America, the Sambaquilla volcano in Peru just shot a plume of volcanic ash approximately 24,000 feet into the air. But hardly anyone is paying any attention to what just took place in Peru because of what happened in the Philippines. On Sunday, the Tal volcano roared to life, and it is being reported that the eruption sent steam, ash, and pebbles up to 10 to 15 kilometers or 6 to 9 miles into the sky. The clouds of ash blew more than 62 miles north, reaching the bustling capital of Manila and forcing the shutdown of the country's main airport, with more than 240 international and domestic flights canceled so far. Unfortunately, authorities are warning that the worst may still be yet to come. In fact, they are telling us that a hazardous explosive eruption could literally happen at any moment. But in the meantime, we continue to see unusual earthquake activity all over the globe. But Michael goes on to conclude his report that there have always been earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. But for most of our lives, we have been able to assume that our planet is generally stable. Unfortunately, that is no longer a safe assumption. We have entered a period of time when all of the old assumptions will no longer apply and everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And we are seeing evidence of that right now from politics to earthquakes to volcanoes, to apocalyptic weather. Everything it seems right now is being shaken. But I just wanted to bring